This is the uh, first installment of our uh, webcast from the Young Physician section, the Practice Management Working Group, and uh, we hope that you'll um, you'll you'll enjoy these series that we have coming out for you. But before we begin, I just wanted to talk about some of the things that we have set up for the um, uh, for the upcoming year with the Young Physician section. Uh, primarily, I wanted you to all check out the website. If you go to entnet.org. Uh, on the left side where it says get involved, the drop down menu. If you go to that drop down menu and then you hit sections and then you can choose the young physician section, you'll see we have some exciting announcements and things for you guys. Uh, in particular, you'll want to take a look at the travel grants uh, to the annual meeting uh, for all uh, some of our new members to help get you involved in the young physician section. Um, if you are interested, they are due tomorrow. So um, get on that uh, short application if you can. And then also we have some model mental awards. Um, submissions are due uh, in about a week's time on July 1st. So if you're interested in nominating a mentor who's meant a lot to you, make sure you check those out as well. We'll also be having a uh, practice management toolkit, which will hopefully be ready in the fall, which we think you guys are really going to love. The practice management working group has really put a lot of time and effort into curating a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, resources and tools that are already available um, through the academy and sort of rating and helping them become a little bit more digestible and uh, easier for you guys to find. So we hope you'll enjoy that. We'll let you know um, as time goes on uh, when it's complete. Uh, tonight we're talking about employment agreements and contracts. Um, this is the first of, uh, we hope, about four or five of these web slash podcasts. Um, the next one will be in about two months time on life, uh, disability, and long-term care insurance. Um, it'll likely be around at the same time, but uh, we're still working on the date with the presenter. So as soon as we have that out, we'll send it out to the attended list on um, uh, uh, for this uh, podcast uh, for this web webinar. Uh, so uh, before we get into some um, uh, some logistics, uh, if everyone could keep um, themselves on mute, that would be great. Um, uh, that way we can all hear uh, um, Nita loud and clear. Uh, and uh, I'll ask you guys to uh, submit any questions that you might have into the chat section and I'll do my best to sort of summarize and provide some questions to Nita once she's done her formal presentation and we'll sort of aim to be done around um, after about 45 minutes. So uh, without uh, any further delay, uh, I want to take a couple seconds to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, it's Nita Gard. Nita is an attorney with uh, Boris Sater, Seymour, and Peds, um, and she solely practices healthcare law. She's had us over a decade of almost a decade of experience, and she also has a master's degree in healthcare law, which she uses on a daily basis. We're really thankful for her to uh, take some time out of her busy schedule to talk to us um, uh, tonight. And uh, on her talk, uh, your first employment agreement. What do you need to do? What do you need to know? Excuse me. <laughs> and, and without further ado, Nita, if you'd like to take it away. Sounds great. Well, thank you everyone, first off, for joining tonight. I know all of you are incredibly busy, especially as young physicians, uh, those of you in residency and fellowship. And then I know the first few years of practice after um, can be overwhelming. So thank you so much for taking the time on a weekday to attend this. Um, I think it's really important for you all to understand some legal aspects to what you're doing as well, though. Med school is fantastic at preparing you for the clinical experience of practicing medicine. Uh, but I think that we all can agree that there might be some issues with preparing you for the business and legal aspects of what you'll be doing. So tonight, I'm giving you kind of like a quick and dirty of your first employment agreement and what you need to know. Um, obviously, this time of the year, that's going to be very relevant to those of you who are starting your first job post-residency and fellowship. But even those of you who have been practicing for a few years, um, if you've never had an attorney review your agreement or really thought twice about just signing on the dotted line for whatever the employer presented you, uh, this is a fantastic primer for things that you need to keep in mind with your uh, agreement renewal or signing an agreement with a new employer. So to start off with, I have to give you the legal jargon disclaimer uh, that the presentation that I'm giving you tonight is not providing legal advice. I'm presenting what I know from experience to be the terms most often in a contract and what the scope of these terms look like. 
please know that there can be wide variations of these terms and your specific contract may not reflect what I present today. Knowing what the general fundamental terms are, however, will be incredibly helpful when you get your contract and have to evaluate what each clause says, the future implications of these clauses, and what terms are worth negotiating. So a little bit about the agenda tonight. Um, I'll give myself a little introduction. We'll talk about considering the environment of the employer that you'll be going to, negotiation strategies, clauses to note, but not necessarily clauses to spend a lot of time on. They're not usually clauses that are worth negotiating um, or negotiable. Pertinent clauses, and these are where the non-competes, the compensation structure, these sorts of things come up. Why negotiation matters. A list of tips that I want to provide you guys for success. And then, uh, as Dr. Gilberto mentioned, we'll end with a Q&A. So a little bit about myself. As Dr. Gilberto mentioned, I'm an attorney at Vori, Sater, Seymour & Peace in the Houston office and a member of the healthcare group. I exclusively focus on pr uh, my practice on assisting clients with various healthcare issues, including those related to fraud and abuse, reimbursement, Medicare and Medicaid compliance, privacy regulations, including HIPAA, physician employment, and various corporate issues, uh, including entity formation and joint ventures. I received my undergraduate and law degree from the University of Texas School of Law and a master's in health law from Loyola University in Chicago. But most importantly, uh, in terms of credentials, my sister is an allergist and my husband's an ENT, so I have a personal interest in the success of young physicians. So to start off with, consider the environment of your practice. So I think a lot of people, um, as you guys know, what your experience is going to be like post-residency and fellowship is going to be very different based on the, envir the environment that you choose. So that can include hospitals and even within hospitals, is it more academic? Are you gonna be doing pediatric, adult? There's small private practice, large private practice groups, other healthcare institutional providers like SNFs, LTACs, hospices, um, government contracts. Will you be working for the VA? Will you be doing a locums contract? So before soliciting a contract for employment, I recommend that you consider what type of practice would best suit your needs and preferences. Uh, for some of you, if you plan on ownership, well, obviously that makes sense to go to a large or small private practice. It might be easier, it's usually easier to uh, work your way up to partner to small group practice versus some of these large private practices that are kind of like the mafia. You might also wanna consider the culture of each environment. So for example, if you value and want to prioritize autonomy, there's likely more autonomy in a small or solo practice than in a hospital-based practice. You also want to know how these cultural differences will influence the scope and formality of the contract you're offered. For example, a hospital will likely have a formal template and negotiating for better or different terms will be a hit or miss. However, hospitals in more rural areas have allowed for more negotiation in my experience because they have a more difficult time recruiting providers. But again, it all depends on your hospital's needs and whether your practice area is in high demand. Um, considering all of you are already specialized, you generally have more leverage than someone like a general pediatrician or general internal medicine. <clears throat> Small practices, on the other hand, generally afford greater flexibility in negotiation um, and we're increasingly seeing practices, but we're increasingly seeing practices unwilling to deviate from the standard terms previously offered to other physicians because they want to avoid comparison and infighting among the physicians. Uh, you'll receive more leverage, however, at these private practices in underserved areas because, like I mentioned, with hospitals, they have a harder time recruiting providers. So you have more leverage there. Which brings me to negotiation strategies. One is your bargaining position. Like I mentioned, if you are willing to move to a rural area or an underserved area or a small practice, you likely are gonna be in a better bargaining position than if you're going to a large institutional provider or going to a saturated market. So for example, if you are planning on going to the largest hospital system in a city and it's a city like Chicago or New York or LA, not only is your salary gonna be significantly lower, you're likely gonna be presented with a template agreement for which there's not really wiggle room. 
if you're willing to move to, you know, a South Dakota or North Dakota, and you're willing to move to a smaller practice there, and they're in dire need of ENTs, you're going to have significantly more leverage. It's also important to know to note what stage you are at negotiating. Are you at the employment agreement stage or are you at the letter of intent stage? There's no right or wrong way to begin, but if you start with a letter of intent, you should take note of whether it's a binding letter of intent or non-binding and whether you're obligated to exclusively negotiate with the practice at the expense of meeting with other employers. Whatever stage you're at, make sure and insist that the terms of the agreement or the letter of intent reflect what was discussed and agreed upon during negotiations. You don't want to be in a position where you were promised something orally, in an email, et cetera, in a meeting, and then those terms don't make it to the contract. Remember that while you may have heard <clears throat> what terms are in your attendings contracts throughout residency or fellowship, you're new to the field. It may not seem like it after you know five plus years of training for you guys, but you're just starting out so you don't have a long list of patients or any colleague or community references or referrals. So this means your bargaining position can be relatively low. It increases with your years of experience, but it's something to keep in mind. As we talk about the standard terms we see in contracts, you'll wanna rank what you want versus what you can live with until your bargaining position is stronger. So that's kind of what we consider our deal breakers. What's, what's the most important to you in your contract? Uh, for some people that could be a lack of non-compete. For some people it's the highest salary possible. For some people it's being in the location that they want. As you go back and forth with your counterpoint on the terms, always remember to remain respectful and show deference during negotiations. As you all are aware, the physician community is quite small and everyone talks to one another. It's one thing to engage in friendly negotiations that result in an offer that you turn down because it doesn't meet your needs, but it's quite another to not get an offer because you were unnecessarily difficult during negotiations. So like I mentioned, uh, there are some clauses that we commonly see in contracts that warrant a brief explanation but are typically not those provisions that necessitate a huge amount of time reviewing and negotiation. So start date versus effective date. The start date is the date that you physically show up to provide professional services. So first day on the job. The effective date could be defined as your start date, so they're the same date, or it could be defined as the date the contract is executed. So it's the day you sign the agreement. This is important because the difference between these dates can impact the timing of other clauses, like when the term of the employment begins, when you can terminate, and whether or not restrictive covenants have begun to toll. Uh, the dif this difference is most important at your, this stage in your career because many of you will sign employment agreements well before you're expected to start. Uh, some of you sign a year or two before you're expecting to start. Confidentiality. So this is a provision that attorneys like to include in agreements that says that you're required to keep all the terms of the contract confidential. This usually applies whether you relay the terms by showing some of the physical contract or you're just telling your friend what the content is. Um, if it's more broadly drafted, this can also include keeping confidential patient lists, policies, procedures, trade secrets, business operations, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, if it's not already in there, we recommend you not just recommend, we insist that you add in language that says that the terms of confidentiality would not apply to you discussing um, anything in there with your counsel, legal counsel. Exclusive negotiations. So this is an important one, but it's typically reserved to letters of intent rather than agreements. And it requires you to only negotiate with one party, which prevents you from starting a bidding war uh, between two parties for your services. It can be present in employment agreements as well, especially if the effective date is the execution date. It means if you sign this agreement, you can't negotiate with another party in hopes of getting a better deal before your start date. Indemnification. Indemnification means that you cover your employer for your negligence, material omissions, fraudulent billing or coding if your employer gets sued. We're not talking about medical malpractice because that's covered by malpractice insurance. This is covered more by administrative screw-ups than clinical screw-ups. 
Um, and by cover, I mean you have to pay or reimburse the employer for any associated expenses. So that could include attorney's expenses, uh, settlement agreements for lawsuits, et cetera. It sounds severe and the cost can be steep, uh, but it's important to note that this is relatively standard in the industry and not something an employer is likely to change. So what we do is recommend that you limit it to negligence and not just innocent mistakes. So if it's a mistake made in good faith, we try to get that language added there so that you're not paying for an innocent mistake. Medical records completion. So this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, most employers will require that you complete medical charts to be completed within a certain time frame, um, or that time frame is defined by the medical staff bylaws. And the reason that they're doing that is that a lot of physicians understandably are swamped and they might take some time completing charts, but that affects the employer's ability to bill and collect for services rendered. And so they want to make sure that they're able to get paid for every procedure you're providing. Breach. So a breach can be defined pretty broadly. Um, example, any failure to satisfy an obligation owed under the contract to your employer or narrowly. Uh, so for example, it's defined as um, specific, by specific parameters which are set forth in the agreement, like suspension or termination of medical privileges. Uh, they also sometimes provide what re attorneys refer to as a cure period for a breach. So that means if one of you breached the agreement, you get X number of days to fix whatever the problem is. Um, so it means that, that if, if you were doing something that was wrong under the agreement, your employer could say, hey, you have 30 days to fix this. If you don't fix it, we're gonna terminate the agreement. Obviously there are breaches that can't be cured. So if your employer's accusing you of, for example, sexual harassment, there's not really a cure for that breach and they likely are able to terminate the agreement. And we can talk about that. We'll talk about that later. Dispute resolution. Um, so this is something that you're seeing in a lot of contracts and not just employment contracts, where the person with the greater bargaining power is trying to force arbitration or mediation um, instead of going to court. And so that's something that you'll be seeing more often as well. So now let's get to the pertinent clauses for negotiation. Compensation and benefits, outside activities, job description, call coverage, restrictive covenants, term, termination, and then gap and tail insurance. So in terms of compensation, first thing we're gonna discuss is a salary or compensation model. So right out of residency or fellowship, you typically will be offered a guaranteed salary or RVU form of comp for at least one year. It's rare to see new physicians operate on a revenue minus expense model because you're building your practice from the ground up and no matter who you are, it takes time. You might also see bonus built into the compensation model as a way to incentivize good behavior, practice efficiencies, productivity, profitability. Additionally, you could be offered a large sum of money towards your student loans. So this money is offered as a loan and not a bonus. It comes with strings attached. It can either be paid all at once directly to you or your lenders or paid in installments. The employer typically makes you sign a promissory note, which is another contract stating that in return for this lump sum, you agree to stay employed there for a certain amount of time. And for each month you stay, an equal portion of your obligation to pay back the money is forgiven. So if you have a $24,000 loan forgiveness lump sum, they'll say every month we'll forgive $1,000 of that. So if you stay two years, the $24,000 is forgiven. If you leave early, it's likely you have to pay some of that money back. So let's look at an example of salary language. So this is as straightforward as it gets. There's a guarantee. At the start date for the first 12 months of employment, subject to any earlier termination, you're paid a salary at the rate of X amount of money per year, payable in equal installments. After your first one to two years of employment, most physicians don't see this again. Um, you show up, don't breach the contract, do your job, and you'll receive the same amount of money each month. What's happening now is after the first year or two, employers are switching to a productivity-based compensation model. So this is some language that you would see with an RVU-based model. 
Focus on the two indented lines. Essentially, the employer determines a dollar amount they'll pay you per RVU. Your compensation then takes the RVUs you personally perform and multiplies it by the set dollar amount. As you can guess, this can only be determined with any accuracy on a retroactive basis, which brings us to the concept of a draw. At the outset, there's a number of RVUs that the employer predicts you'll be able to perform in a certain time frame. You're paid on a regular basis, whether that's monthly, bi-weekly, whatever the employer's payroll is, based on the estimated number or draw. There's then a reconciliation between your draw and your actual performance, with the gap being paid by the employer if you overperformed or by you if you underperformed. So this language is just one example of bonus based on annual productivity, likely because the base salary was a guarantee model. Please note that you can't be paid twice for the same work. So this language wouldn't work if the base salary was a productivity model. If the base salary is a productivity model, your bonus could be calculated, for example, from patient satisfaction surveys or exceeding a threshold of um, RVUs or increasing the RVU percentage. There are many varieties of bonus, including a signing bonus, which I'm assuming a lot of you are hoping to get. But with signing bonuses, it's important to note that a lot of agreements will require you to pay back the signing bonus if the agreement is terminated early. What I do is I recommend that physicians at least try to negotiate for a prorated repayment. So for every year that you stay at this employer, they'll forgive X amount of the signing bonus repayment and negotiate so that there's no repayment if the employer terminates without cause or you terminate with cause. So if you terminate because the employer did something wrong, you shouldn't be penalized by having to pay back your signing bonus. Um, as I discussed earlier, loan forgiveness, here's some sample language. It's a lump sum of money that you're obligated to repay if the conditions for repayment aren't met. Um, and that's detailed in the promissory note. Outside activities. So at this stage in your career, an employer wants 100% of your time. So they will limit your ability to engage in outside activities or limit your ability to keep any money from these activities. This can include volunteering, working with pharma or medical device companies, giving speeches, etc. Whether this is important varies by individual. Some of you may not want to mess with any outside activities, so you don't care. Um, and some of you are more entrepreneurial or looking for side hustles. So look to what the restrictions are on the type of activities, how much time you can spend on them, and whether or not you, you can keep what you get paid, and realistically, whether or not this is a deal breaker for you. Here's an example of uh, language with regard to restrictions on outside activities. And this PowerPoint will be available later, so if you guys want to look at this sample language later, I just don't want to waste time reading you these provisions. So job description. It's important that the job description matches what you had discussed with the employer. So that includes any clinical service, well, primarily clinical services, but in addition to that, what administrative roles are you expected to serve? Are you expected to teach? Are you expected to do research? Um, if you want to do research, you want to make sure that there's research time carved out. It's a simple concept. Make sure that what you're told you will do is what you're doing, where you'll do it, and it's reflected in the description. If you are split, if you want to split your time 50-50, for example, between clinical research and clinical and research duties, make sure that's protected in writing. So here's an example. A lot of agreements they included in an attachment to the agreement and it lists out in bullet points what you're expected to do. Call coverage. So note that this can be written as broad and narrow as desired. If you're offered additional payment for call coverage, we recommend that you negotiate the hour, the, ex the hours expected, whether or not it's exclusive, as in you can only provide call at this employer, and how much you're gonna be paid for it. Is it 24 hour call coverage a week? Do you have to be immediately available or just via phone call but not go in? 
Are you sharing coverage? If so, is that going to be shared equally? Um, how is the schedule determined? Can you take call at other healthcare providers? Do you have to pay your own backup if you have a conflict or vacation? And will you be paid for it or is it built into your salary as a job duty? So all of those are things that you guys need to consider with call coverage provisions. So here's some sample, sample language that you might see with regard to call language expectations. So with the first one, it's either telephone consultation or available within 15 minutes, and it's 24 hour call coverage. Uh, the second one specifies that you're gonna be paid for every 24 hour period of coverage, but you're not allowed to provide call at another employer. So here is what a lot of physicians worry about, restrictive covenants. So what are they? In the context of an employment agreement, a restrictive covenant is a provision in a contract that places limits on your ability to provide professional services or restricts your ability to solicit former employees, um, patients or employees. The AMAs actually come out against restrictive covenants as saying they're against public policies. They're generally disfavored as restraints of trade and unenforceable unless certain requirements are met. Um, the law doesn't permit unreasonable limitation on employees' abilities to change employers or solicit patients or former co-employees. But how restrictive covenants are treated can be very state dependent. So as someone who's practiced in Texas for a while, I'll tell you Texas is a, an example of a state that's very protective of restrictive covenants because they tend to be an employer-friendly state. Even then, there are certain requirements that must be in place. Um, but unlike other states where a lot of times non-competes are generally not enforceable, Texas, they're enforceable. So that's something to keep in mind, what kind of state you're practicing in. So for non-competes, they usually comprise three things. Geographical scope, so how far is that non-compete applying? How long is that non-compete applying with duration? And then whether or not you could pay the employer a certain amount of money to avoid that non-compete. So for the non-compete, it's important to look at when it's triggered. Is it, term is it just when you terminate the contract early without cause? If the contract expires, even if no one terminated it, are you still subject to the non-compete? Is it only if they terminate you for cause? Uh, what we recommend is you should never have a non-compete enforced if you have to terminate the agreement for cause. So if the employer does something against the agreement, you shouldn't have to be subject to the non-compete. So that's one thing that we recommend you fight against. With regard to duration, one to two years is typical. Um, with regard to geographical scope, you need to look to see if it's the entire county or contiguous counties if you're in a rural area. Is it a certain mile radius from your office or hospital? If you're at a practice where there are multiple offices, is it from every office the practice has, or is it just from the office where you primarily provided services? So the place that it, during the term of the agreement, you provided more than 50% of your services. What we recommend doing is trying to create, if you can get the non-compete st struck altogether, that'd be fantastic. If not, you wanna make it as narrow as possible, it's not, especially if you are in a specialty where it'd be difficult to get another job. So that's something that you guys need to keep in mind. Um, there's also some states require a buyout. <clears throat> so in Texas, one of the requirements of a non-compete is that there's a set amount at which you can buy out the non-compete and you're no longer subject to it because it goes to the underlying reason for a non-compete, that the employer would be financially harmed by competition. So instead of agreeing that the harm's irreparable, you're putting a monetary value on it. You can also attempt to negotiate that the non-compete doesn't apply if you enter into private practice because the level of competition is different. This only works if you're employed by a hospital and only for some specialties. Um, regardless of the variables, non-competes shouldn't be so broad that you're forced to move out of state, for example, or can't practice medicine. With regard to uh, non-solicitation, so here's some sample non-compete language. This is an example during the employment term and then two years after. Its scope is the entire county and extends beyond just employment, but also prevents setting up a private practice.
and investing in anything. Here's another example. This one's just a year, uh, but extends not just throughout the county in which the employer is located, but all contiguous counties as well. Uh, so this is something you're more likely to see in a rural area. With regard to non-solicitation, um, this, uh, the duration and triggering events will likely match those for the non-compete clause, but pay attention to who it covers. Clinical staff, administrative staff, patients, uh, what behaviors are prevented? So generally speaking, they can stop you from proactively soliciting a former employees and clients, but if you put out a general advertisement for employees and a former employee happens to respond, that shouldn't apply. If you have a patient that chooses to come to your new practice, that shouldn't apply. So here's some sample language for non-solicitation provision. Um, this is an overly broad non-solicitation clause and one that we would push back on, specifically the long period of enforcement, the notion of a prospective customer, and the vague notion of diverting patients or prospective patients in any way. Uh, it's not very clear what behaviors or what actions on your part would trigger this clause. It's also important to note whether or not your agreement discusses notice to patients if you terminate employment. So here's an example language. While this does not stipulate that the message to patients will be mutually agreed upon, it does set forth what the letter will contain. Um, it's important to note that certain state medical boards place the onus on the physician to comply with notification requirements. So in those states, while the employer can send out the notification letter to patients, if the employer botches the process, it's your license on the hook. So I recommend that physicians ensure that they're, they have access to any patient records that are necessary to comply with their own notification requirements under state law, and that the employer doesn't get complete control over how patients are notified. So length of term. This is a simple concept to be aware of, how term is defined. Typically, you see an initial term, you know, anywhere from one to two to three years. Sometimes it'll be five, but it's usually one to three, separated from subsequent terms that automatically kick in, which are called renewal terms. We bring this up to highlight your responsibility to know what obligations and benefits you have during the initial term versus the renewal term, and negotiate accordingly if you want something to run for a shorter or longer duration. So termination options. You want to make sure there's an out to your agreement. What seems reasonable and fantastic now may not materialize when you get there. Um, without cause provisions allow either party to walk away with a provision of notice period. So basically either you or your employer provides the other person noti written notice of anywhere from 30 to 180 days for any reason. You don't even have to give a reason. You can just say, I want to move to Hawaii. Um, but it's remember to check what other clauses are affected if you exercise a without cause termination. For example, does it trigger a non-compete? Uh, does it trigger repayment on loan forgiveness? Terminating with cause means that someone screwed up and that screw up is the reason the contract's being terminated. It's common for employers to specify that they have the option to terminate with cause, but they sometimes do not spell out what constitutes cause. It is very important that the agreement spells that out. It's less common for physicians to have the option to terminate for cause and for that cause to be defined. Understandably, the employer wants to limit your ability to exit the agreement. It's, your interest to make, it's in your interest to make sure that the contract <clears throat> says that you can terminate for cause and that the cause is defined, even if it's as basic as the employer fails to fulfill their obligations under this agreement. Additionally, you wanna make sure that you're given a cure period of at least 30 days for any termination against you. This means that if your employer finds cause and must tell you in writing uh, what the cause is and that you have 30 days to fix it before you can be fired on that basis. Again, remember what other clauses in the contract are triggered if you terminate for cause or if, you are, if you're terminated for cause. So here's an example of termination without cause. It basically says either party can terminate the agreement by providing four months written notice to the other party. Here's an example of with cause. 
<clears throat> and this is with cause by physician. So this says that you can terminate the agreement. Um, sorry, this is for the employer. Um, if you, so you provide notice to the employer and you say, hey, you haven't done X, Y, and Z. I'm giving 30 days to fix it and they don't, you can terminate the agreement. So examples would be failure for them to pay the compensation that you're due, failure to provide um, equitable access to revenue opportunities, failure to assign call coverage in an equitable fashion. So if you're doing 90% of the call and that's not what the agreement said, um, and the agreement defines for cause termination as one of those reasons, you could terminate. So I know we're running out of time, so I'll try to wrap this up. Uh, gap tail insurance, who's buying it? When's it triggered? Those are the most important things to remember. If you're employed, the employer almost always pays for your malpractice insurance. Malpractice insurance can be claims made or occurrence based. So occurrence based means that neither you or your employer will be required to pay for tail insurance when, when and if you leave. When, when and if you leave. It means it's based on when the event triggering the claim occurred. Claims based is understandably, it's when the claim is made. So if the claim is made after the term of your agreement, your claims based insurance wouldn't cover that. So you need to buy tail to cover that. These are expensive. Um, so employers try to push this onto employees. So we recommend negotiating that obligation uh, to purchase tail insurance operate like loan forgiveness, whereby if you stay with the employer for X number of years, you won't be required to pay for tail or you'll be required to only pay a portion of tail. If you terminate for cause or if the employer terminates without cause, you should try to negotiate that you're not obligated to purchase tail regardless of when you terminate. So here's sample language uh, with regard to tail insurance. It usually has some magic phrase about sole expense. <coughs> so it's important that you try to get out of paying for tail insurance. And obviously an employer has an incentive to get claims-based insurance because it's cheaper than occurrence-based insurance. So to start wrapping this up, why negotiation matters. So remember your bargaining position may be relatively weak now, but it'll make a dramatic jump in a few years. And like I said, it also depends on what sort of employer you're seeking, how saturated the market is, and how, how significant the need is for your employer. Um, and the fact that you guys are specialists will also be helpful. Um, but that said, usually your first agreement out of training, you're not going to be in the best position to no negotiate whatever you want. So don't make your goal with negotiations to win on everything. Shoot for a mutual win, a fair deal. This is much more beneficial long-term and will make your employer eager and excited to have you rather than viewing your employment with dread. As you gain experience and reputation, negotiating power leans in your favor. That said, if you want the most leverage with negotiations, as I mentioned, you likely have to go to private practices in rural areas and you'll have more leverage if you have a highly specialized practice area. However, don't minimize the importance of your contract or negotiations. When you're recruited and talking with your colleagues and everything's nice and friendly and amicable, there's an enormous sense of trust me, it'll all work out. However, as an attorney, we're cynical by nature. If it's not written in the contract, it doesn't exist. I don't care what they told you in the interview, what they told you over the phone, in an email, via text message. I don't care if it's in writing. If it's not in the contract, it doesn't exist and it doesn't apply. Remember that you're hired by doctors, but you're fired by lawyers. So make sure the contract's buttoned up on the front end and you stand a better chance of leaving on good terms. So here's just a quick and dirty list of tips for success. These are just tips I've collected over the years from my experience representing physicians and employers, and it'll help you be successful. So one is your credentialing packet. Make sure you fill it out on time. Relatedly, your state licensure, um, that can take quite a while to get properly credentialed and licensed in your new state for your new employer. <clears throat> so make sure you start that process immediately because it will impact your start date. And you don't wanna be in a position where you're supposed to start September 1st and you're not licensed. 
be responsive to any to administrators and staff and any emails and phone calls that they uh, give you. Ask questions, don't assume anything. Read all of your paperwork, including policies, procedures that you your contract might say you have to abide by. <clears throat> and there'll be some language in there that says, for example, employee agrees to comply with employer's policies and procedures, including those related to blah, blah, blah. Make sure that you receive those policies and procedures if the contract refers to them. Be entrepreneurial, be proactive. Um, think about long-term, what do you want from this employer? Don't disparage anyone, because like I mentioned, the physician community is small. Attend meetings, be involved. Um, and then I recommend hiring a healthcare attorney. And even if you don't have leverage to negotiate a contract, I still recommend an attorney just because you wanna know what you're signing up for and it might not change, you might not be able to change any terms, but it might change your mind on whether or not this is a good business decision for you to join a practice. So with that, um, I think I've reached my time and was curious if anyone had any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Anya, that was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> And while people are typing out some of their questions in the chat, if they have access to it, I'll start off with uh, one of the one that actually dovetails off of your last point there in the sense that, you know, when is, like, what are the nuts and bolts of getting an attorney involved? Like, when should we do it? Is it like the, you know, the like conversations over the phone, the emails, the like casual stuff, or is it once we get the contract and, you know, how, you know, what's sort of a time frame for this? Uh, in terms of how long negotiations can take. And then if you, I, I know you're not one to say, you know, to give like a price, but just sort of like a ballpark of how much someone's looking to sort of review and negotiate for, uh, for contracts. So I recommend that you start talking to an attorney as soon as you have an offer, just because the way that engaging an attorney works is we have to, we have a you know a week or two delay from you giving us a first call to us being able to work on anything for you guys because we have mm -hmm. professional responsibility we have to do something first that's referred to as a conflict check so we need to make sure that for example we don't represent your your potential employer and so we have this whole process we have to draft an engagement letter so it's not like you can call an attorney at 1 p.m and then they can start reviewing your contract at 103 p.m there's a couple of days delay where we get everything set up. And so you don't wanna be in a position where the employer says, hey, you need to sign this contract by Friday. And you try to call an attorney on Thursday and say, do you mind looking at this? Um, so I recommend at least priming the attorney as early as you can when you know that it might be a sure deal and you're just waiting on the contract. And then what happens is after you've engaged the attorney, um, we review the contract and you tell us, you know, what, how much do you want? Do you want nuts and bolts, you know, change, mark everything up, change everything up. We've got, you know, lots of le negotiation leverage. Or are you saying, hey, I just want, is there anything glaring? Is there anything that seems really problematic? Otherwise I plan on signing this. Um, for most young physicians, I would say reviewing a contract on the attorney's end can take anywhere from two to three hours to 10 hours, depending on how much negotiation there is. I've done employment agreements where, for example, in Texas, it'll be uh, and it, someone who's working with Texas Children's Hospital, which is a large institutional employer. That is a template agreement. You were, the, hell will freeze over before Texas Children's will let you make a change to their agreement. <clears throat> and so that's gonna be a much shorter process. I'm just telling you, you know, this is what you need to be aware of with regard to the non-compete, you know, it's 40 miles, X, Y, and Z. If it's an employer, I was recently working with a physician <clears throat> who was going out to a rural area in Alaska, so there was a lot more leverage. They'd been needing this very specialized urologist. And so that was a much more extensive process because there was a lot of back and forth between the employer and the physician. Um, a lot of healthcare attorney or a lot of attorneys will do discounted rates for people in their last year of residency or fellowship. Uh, so that's something you can look to. and. Lawyers either work on a flat fee or an hourly rate. Um, with a flat fee, you know what you're getting. So I highly recommend for you guys to try to find an attorney who's willing to work with you guys on a flat fee, because otherwise for 
an employment agreement review, that can add up, the price can add up pretty quickly on an hourly rate, even if it's two to 300 an hour, you can quickly get into the thousands of dollars. Great, that's very helpful. Do you think you can um, just go back in the presentation to your contact info? Because I think some people were looking to potentially have that. Um, and then um, one uh, question that I had with those templated agreements, I mean, sometimes there will be things that are promised to you. For instance, uh, a mentor of mine said that never, uh, never take a job that doesn't guarantee you a 7.30 OR block time start. Uh, and, um, you know, is there a way to get those promises that were made sort of in an email or something into something that is at least uh, somewhat that'll stand up in like a, a dispute or, 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 or a leaving for cause sort of thing on the physician side? So if it's something that the employer genuinely wants to offer you and has said, you know, in an email or a text message or in person, then I would just, you know, press the employer and say, hey, clearly if you have no problem offering this, this has to be included in the agreement. Because if it's not included in the agreement, it's generally irrelevant because most agreements have what we refer to as boilerplate provisions, one of which is essentially there's a provision that says anything not included in this agreement does not apply to this agreement. We call it the four corners test, which is if it's not included in the four corners of this paper, no court's going to consider it. And so you need to press for them to include anything that you've been promised orally, verbally, I mean, orally or in writing uh, needs to make it into the agreement. Otherwise, it's not that they can't offer it to you. It's that you've got no leverage if they don't offer it to you. And you've got, you've got nothing. You can't argue with that. Right. Okay. Good to know. Uh, we've got another question from um, the chat about um, considering some more of the academic jobs. Um, should, uh, you know, should you have the criteria for advancement being built into the contract? Um, or is that sort of more, you know, refers to a like departmental policy and that that's sort of a sufficient? That's usually departmental policy. Usually what we see with regard to academic jobs and criteria for advancement um, or even partnership track at, for, at employers, it'll say something like parties will agree to discuss, you know, potential for advancement in X number of years, which is really just like, an agreement to talk, um, but if it's a if it's an academic institution that has a clearly defined process for advancement, if it's not already included in the agreement, I would recommend citing to any policy or procedure that discusses that advancement. Or if it's a very clear thing and you feel like you have leverage, have it written out and says, you know, in two years, parties agree to um, review, evaluate physician to determine whether or not physician shall be, you know, promoted from associate professor to assistant professor based on the following criteria. And so lay out that process in the agreement. But again, a lot of that's still going to be at the employer's discretion because they're going to have some purposely vague language about, you know, if the physician meets employer's criteria for advancement. Okay. Great. Good to know. Uh, another question was, uh, what are some, like, clear red flags for a bad agreement and also sort of more of a question on my end what are some what are some things that are most often missed in a an employment agreement that the physicians should advocate for are placed into an agreement so what major red flag is if the agreement is unilateral so if the agreement is completely one-sided and benefiting the employer that is a complete red flag to me um, if so, if they're saying that the employer can terminate at any time for any reason, but the physician can, if they're saying that the employee has to return any signing bonus regardless of why the agreement was terminated, if it's a non-compete that's completely ridiculous, even if it's not enforceable, it tells you a lot about the culture of the employer. Another thing that I tell people to look for, and this isn't necessarily in the agreement, but something to keep in mind, if the employer has to, has high turnover, that's a huge red flag. So you also want to see, so for example, if you're wanting to work at a private practice and make partner, if you're seeing that nobody's made partner in the last five to 10 years, you have to ask yourself, why is that? If you're seeing that they're hiring new physicians every year or two, you want to ask yourself why that is. 
So those are red flags that I really recommend people look out is, um, does the employer seem to be only looking out for their best interest and not a mutually beneficial relationship between the physician and employer? And then with regard to what physicians aren't looking for, um, like I said, even in instances where you can't negotiate or make changes to an agreement, which is fairly common, it's still important that you know what you're signing up for. So know if you're, what you're signing up for with regard to a non-compete. Know what you're signing up for in terms of your compensation structure. So if there is potential for bonus, but it's based on your productivity, um, but you don't make sure that you have access to any records regarding your productivity level, you can't say anything if you feel like you're being undercompensated because they'll just tell you, well, our records show us that you deserve X amount of money. So make sure that you're fully aware of what you're signing on to with regard to non-compete, your ability to question your compensation, um, outside activities, like know what your restrictions and prohibitions are under the agreement as well. Great. Um, I think we're <clears throat> getting close to the end of uh, of our time for question and answer. Before um, we finish, I was uh, going to ask if you, you know, just sort of the nuts and bolts. Uh, is there sort of a an association or a website for healthcare attorneys so that people can go and find reputable attorneys who have an idea of what's involved um, in, uh, you know, evaluating a, a doctor's contract. And then a second point, is it important to find someone that knows about your state, has some familiarity with the state, or like, is location important to where the attorney, uh, to where the attorney is, to where you're going to be going for your job? I do think location is important. Uh, you want someone licensed in that state because a lot of employment law is is state-based. So for example, when I talked about restrictive covenants, Texas, as I mentioned, is a state that is very pro-restrictive covenants. And so you want someone who's familiar with that and also familiar with the market and can tell you about, you know, what to expect from certain employers or how much leverage there is. And so I think that's very important. So find someone licensed in your state, ask around to see what physicians, um, who your attendings have used, who your colleagues have used, and who they recommend. And I highly, I can't emphasize this enough. Make sure you go to a healthcare attorney because a lot of provisions are healthcare specific and you can't go to a generalist. And, and you guys of all people know that sometimes it's very important to go to a specialist instead of a generalist. So if you're getting, you know, a deviated septum fix, you don't want to go to someone in internal medicine, right? You don't want to go to someone with general surgery residency. You want to go to some, want to go to an ENT. And so that's how I feel about physician employment agreements with regard to going to a healthcare attorney. Um, so that's something I highly recommend. The American Health Lawyers Association, I don't know if they have, they're the largest health lawyer association in the country. Um, I don't know if they list um, have a list of you know attorneys who are, who can help, but that would be a, probably a good starting point. Um, if not, just ask around, and you should be able to get a good name. But try the American Health Lawyers Association. Great, that's uh, that's awesome. And on that lovely uh, analogy between ENT and uh, the law, we will uh, end it. Unless there are any pressing questions from anyone else, um, I just wanted to take another second to really thank you, Nita. This was an incredible presentation, and I know I learned um, a lot. And I hope that uh, everyone else felt it was as um, uh, educational and useful as I did. So thank you again so much. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. I appreciate it. I know you're very busy.